Oh yes. Once again, are you ready to receive the word of God? Yes. yes. Amen. 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 Uh, you know, uh, we continue with our series, which is af what after the resurrection. And uh, for some reason, I, I never intended it to be so long. I mean, we started this from Easter, and it's still continuing until in July. And I don't think uh, we will be able to we'll be able to stop it in this month also. It will still continue. And the reason it is, is, is very important. It's important that we continue this series. There, there are three, four reasons. First reason is to, for, for us to know the changes that need to happen within us. See, when Easter happened, when Jesus died, there was, there was not much change which happened in people's lives. The, what happened, the, even the disciples, they went into their shelters, they went into their homes, and they started living their own life. Even they went on in, into their professions, right? They were, they were, some of them were fishermen. So they went about fishing. They went about doing fishing and all. So in, in that way, life continued after Jesus' death. But things changed drastically, turned upside down for the world with these few disciples are only after the resurrection. So that is why it is so important. We need to see we have already have a celebrity Easter. Life goes on, we continue to live. But has anything changed within us? So we need to identify first uh, what changes could happen within us. That's the first point. Second point is to do a self-assessment of where we are, where we stand in terms of our relationship with God. Third thing, the reason is what should we do of the areas where we are falling short? And there is no other person better than ourselves to know where we are falling short in terms of our relationship with God and with our neighbor. Why is it important? It's important because there is going to be no more taking of the cross by Jesus. And Jesus is not going to be crucified for our sake once again. No, it will not happen. He is not going to be laid down in the tomb once again. It is not going to happen. He Will, there will not be another resurrection friends because all this has happened once and for all it is not going to happen but what is going to happen is now that the king Jesus Christ is going to come as king of kings and lord of lords this is the thing which is going to happen it is going to happen soon if you look at the bible you will see that what whatever is happening happening today in this world is fallen as per what is given in the bible and it will scare you but we don't need to be afraid. We need to be prepared. That's all. We need to know the fact that it is going to happen. And He is coming soon. So this series is basically to help us to prepare ourselves. So before we look into what we are going to speak about today, shall we just say a short prayer? Thank you Lord for this time. Thank you Lord for your presence here. Thank you Lord for your people here Lord. Father Lord, as we come before your throne Lord, to listen to your word, Lord, which you have for us today, Lord Jesus, Lord, we give us listening ears, Lord Jesus, and a heart that is ready to receive your word, Lord. Let nothing distract us, Lord Jesus. Help us to focus totally upon you, Lord Jesus. Now, before the Lord, as I stand here to deliver your word to your people, including myself, Lord Jesus, Lord, fill me with your spirit, Lord. That whatever comes out of my mouth will be from you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We just submit this time into your hands, Lord. In your name, Lord, we say. Amen. 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 Alright, so I'll be speaking about partial obedience to you today. Is it acceptable to God or not? And why do I need to take that? As I was saying, I will talk about, about after resurrection. In Matthew 28, verse 18 to verse 20, what is it in there? Then Jesus, this is the time when Jesus ascended into heaven. He left the disciples and he's going back to his father. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you to the very end of the age. Today we are going to look at verse 20. It says, Teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. 
right is clear so the instructions are to teach right not to order not to command not to force them uh, these uh, these conditions on them not to impose them it is to teach them to teach them to obey see obedience is something that has to be taught it has to be taught it does not come to us naturally when there is a small baby so many of us are parents when we have an infant baby the child is small we teach the child to obey and respect the parents it doesn't come naturally into that person if that person if the child is left into, into let's say the jungle where there is no human being nobody to teach the nature will be totally different totally different there will be no respect of course because not been taught there will be no obedience not been taught and many other things so the obedience is one thing which needs to be taught friends if it is taught to us and we learn it it will not go out of the system easily you will always remember it we will always remember if if what is being taught to us and we are willing to learn it how many of you will learn a to 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 cycle how to ride a cycle how many of you learned to uh, to swim how many of you learned to be able to walk have you forgotten these things we don't forget is always there because we also want to learn it we want to learn uh, how to cycle we, we today also i mean i have been i have cycled on a cycle for many years but if i am given a cycle i will be able to i will to ride it if i am in the water i will be able to swim if i am swimming so like this there are many things which if you are willing to learn and we are taught we don't forget but on the other side if it is forced upon us or ordered that we may learn it but then over a period of time we will we would like to prefer to forget it we would like to we, we remember it of course we will remember it most of it but then we would prefer not to recollect it we would like to prefer to forget it i had i had a teacher i had a tough time in in my school days i mean everything was fine english was good hindi was good sanskrit was very good and uh, the challenge was science and mathematics i could not i knew 2 plus 2 is equal to 4 but beyond that i was not able to use a prime mind especially when that guy was there and i still remember his, his name was kazmi mr kazmi and he was there his personality was so huge and he always had a stick hard stick in his hand and i was really i loved that stick because all used to always to come to me lovingly and almost in every class i was a person that one or two i used to get i could not understand and out of fear whatever i learned it was only out of fear and then as soon as let's say uh, science topics as soon as i had the option of to leaving science and going into commerce i was really happy next year oh science away out of my life i took on commerce but again the mathematics continued because the accounting was there but then i started to like it and learn it in a different way so that's my example sure you would have your own examples you know friend the point that i want to make here is that obedience is a process it is not a gift salvation is a gift but obedience is not a gift we obey god because of who he is not that he has given us a gift to obey him no he could have done that he could have programmed it that way that we would only be submitting to him already obeying what god has needed he gave us free will so we obey him for who he is and what he is doing in our lives today friends i am not going to talk about obedience instead i am going to talk about something which is very much linked to obedience but not obedience it is important that i need to talk to you about this because it is the biggest hindrance to each one of us in terms of us obeying god and because we are totally reliable and comfortable in that we are happy in that it's a comfort zone we are content and that's the danger with that is the dangerous uh, that's so dangerous for us 
It's a false security that we are having on partial obedience. Partial obedience, friends. We happily believe that partially obedience is better than no obedience. Oh, at least I, I do obey some some uh, some uh, of the other commandments. Something which the Lord has said. Not all, but at least some of the one or two of them, maybe or five or six of them, and then we are comfortable. But friends, partial obedience to God is not obedience at all. No, in the Bible you will find that partial obedience is acceptable. And as I said, I will speak about partial obedience, but Brother Raju will speak about complete obedience and uh, next Sunday. You know, a good example of uh, partial obedience is when uh, you ask your children, right? in today's world people have children have their own rooms and all that. You ask the children, okay, you clean your room. And you be very stern, no, you have to clean your room, go and clean your room, this very moment. They will grumble and go. And just in 10 minutes they are out. When you go into the room, you find oh, everything is thick and fine, nothing is there on the ground, our bed sheet is fine. But if you open the cupboard, so they have picked up everything and just dumped it somewhere, wherever they would find space. That is partial obedience. Will you be happy as parent? You will not be happy. If you submit your experiment, partial, complete, few things which you miss up, you just miss out. You don't care, okay, find uh, the examiner should. Oh, come on, he's an examiner, he's a learned person. He should understand these things. He's just taken for granted. I don't need to write it down. He will never accept that. You may do your submissions, but he will not accept it. Well, it's partial. Are you getting it, friends? I know of a person who, uh, who always says that a person Cannot cannot obey all all the commandments of God. It's not possible. But that person is sincere and very serious in keeping some. So I'm very. I know. I keep my commandments. What are these commandments? I don't murder anyone. Come on, guys. Has is anybody murdered here? Any, any any other person? No. Who goes and murders a person? So he say I'm I'm happy that I'm not, I'm keeping that commandment. I do not murder. I do not kill anyone. And then I do not steal. Steal means for them robbing, committing a decoity or robbing a bank or something like that. But when I question this person, what about stealing from the government in terms of income tax savings? So come on, that's something which is uh, we need to do. Otherwise, the government will take all the money. And when finally that person would end this conversation by saying that, hey, come on, I do keep some of the commandments. For the others, it is humanly not possible. Yes, I agree. It may not be possible in our own strength, but we have a God who has promised us to give us that strength, right? We have a God who has promised us to give us that strength. To be able to do that, it's difficult. Yes, I don't disagree with that. And this person will end also by saying that, come on, God should be happy at least not keeping some of the commandments. Look at the others. They don't keep any commandment or they don't follow God at all. These people are walking on thin ice. And I will pray for these such peace, such people that the Lord will open their eyes and the Lord has opened eyes for some of some some of them and they are beginning to see the truth. You know the majority of believers fail in their walk with God because of the lack of complete obedience. They feel comfortable and satisfied with the partial obedience to God. And if you ask them, they have multiple reasons for that. This is my job's demand. This is the practice of the world. I need to sustain my family. I need to go faster in my company. I need to get promotions. I need to do this. I need to do that. Hey, Pastor, why are you upset? At least I do come to the church. Maybe once or once in a month, but I do come to the church. Why are you craving? You want tithes? I'll pay you tithes. You want offering? I'll pay you offering. Give you offering. It's not about all these things. It's something more. The Lord seeks obedience in every aspect. It's like saying, partially, your will be done in my life, and partially, my will will be done in my life. Because it's my life. I'm living it. But if the Lord takes it away, where, what will you do with your life? 
We ourselves cannot hold a life or extend a life for even two seconds. Or five, or, I mean, it's a challenge. It's a challenge that people from, from the poor pulpit or preachers give to the people. Okay, you have control of your life. Hold your life, hold your breath for 10 minutes. And then we'll see what happens. Nobody can. It's in your power, but you will not do it. Why? Because we don't, if we do that, we may lose our life. And we don't have any control over life. Friends, as I was saying, such people are treading on dangerous ground. It's like quicksand. And they're sinking deeper and deeper into it, and they don't even realize it. That's the sad part. There are many times when we apply our own understanding based on the acquired knowledge and the experience. I'm not saying it's wrong. I mean, we do need to make decisions based on our experience, on the knowledge that we have gained, right? When, when, when we apply for jobs, we, they ask for your experience so that they are comfortable that you know what to, you, are, you are capable of. And how do we know that we are capable of doing it? Because we have done it in the past so many years. So we have that experience. But would it be good that whatever we have, whatever exposure or whatever we have with us, if we can bring it to the Lord. If we can just bring our decisions to the Lord. Okay, Lord, based on our, dis on our, on our knowledge, based on experience and whatever we, what you have given us, uh, on using our wisdom, this is what we think should be the right path for this. Bring it to the Lord. Lord, if it is your will, I would like to proceed with this. The Lord will bless you in that. Because you are submitting your will, your decision to His will and His decision. Why this is failing? Why are people losing their jobs? Why are people, uh, students are not doing, doing, able to do well in the exams? Why are people not able to secure jobs? These are, these are the reasons. Because we need to submit, Lord, this is, I feel this is good for me. And that's what I, I mean, I always do that. I'm not in the hard way, but this is what I do. Before taking on this new role in, in, in the bank, I ask God, God, I want to do this role. I feel I'm capable because every, when I was, I, I have enough putting uh, uh, points, how well I'm suited for that job. Uh, except for IT, I, everything was a tick. Lord, should I take this job? Because I knew it, if I went into that job, I would, of course, I would be promoted and all those, those things would be there. But I would be, I would be highlighted to the senior management. Of the, all, everything was good was there. But the thing is, will I be able to deliver? The, the management is trusting me and taking me against people, other other people. Will I be able to uh, justify their decision? So I I gave it to God. God, you decide. From there, I want to do it. Uh, it is going to change our life and bring it bring us back to to what we were earlier. I submit it to you. And God, in His own way, He, he made me. He made it very clear. Yes, you go this way. And I did. And I did. I praise God for that. That it proved that yes, my decision and His decision aligned, and we are really good. Praise God for that. You know, in the Bible, there are many instances of men favored by God, but while obeying God, they did things based on their own judgment, for which they had to pay. In fact based on their judgment, today, in this world, we also have to, uh, we have to pay for that. If you look into the book of Genesis, Adam and Eve, God told them something. They were supposed to obey God. But Satan went there and deceived them. Right? And today also, their sin, that sin is carrying on. The sin brought death, and the death is continuing, and sin and death are continuing till today's life, and it will continue till the end of times. In Genesis again, in Genesis 12, verse 1, you can see that the Lord came to Abraham, who later on the Lord named Abraham, to do what? To leave your country, your people, your home, your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. These are the instructions from God to Abraham. This is what you need to do. Very clear, very crystal. There are uh, 
Can you see anything which is confusing here? In these instructions? Conscious. Does not know confusion. Here it's very clear. So he was supposed to take whatever his was his own, his own only, not his father's. Take his own, of course his wife, and go from his father's place. So Abraham obeyed the part of leaving the father's place. In that he obeyed about God's instructions about leaving behind everything from father's side. But you know what he did? He used his own wisdom. He used his own thinking. He applied his own mind there. And what he did? He took his wife and along with his wife he took his nephew Lot. Right? He took Lot with him. Now God's instructions were not about Lot that you can take your nephew or somebody your loved one or your friend of yours. No, nothing. And the Lord Lot was not his own child. If he had been his own child, of course, then his own family. But he did. And then Abraham, I mean, you see, Abraham basically wasn't willing to let go of everything. And not, I'm not sure why he took Lot. Maybe as a companion, or he had a good rapport with him, or th there was a closeness between them, for whatever reason. But it wasn't what God had wanted him to do. And if you read in the Bible later on, you will find that Lot, the Lot's presence in, in Abraham's life caused so much of problem for them. I mean what happened was God did, did not go against them. God did not punish Abraham for that. Okay, why, why did you bring Lot? He did not, God did not question him that. But God knew what was going to happen in the future. They uh, tried to expand it. So they have many people. They had uh, many, many cattle, many sheep, many cows. And they were, because of that there was a conflict between Lot's people and Abraham's people. Heated argument, fights every day. And finally what happened? There was no other solution but to divide the tribe into two parts. One going this side and the other going the other side. And that would have been really painful for both Abraham as well as Lot. Now Abraham would have really uh, uh, avoided this if he had obeyed God and not brought in Lot. Not brought in Lot. Friends, if we look back in our lives, there are decisions that we have made believing that those are the right things to do. But later on, we have regretted. Let's look back into our lives. We know each other, we know our, what things that we have done. We have made decisions which were not correct. I've done it many times. And these are irreversible. You can't go back into time and change them. You would want them to do, you want to do it. But they're, they're irreversible. I'm sure in, in, in your lives also you would be having many such regrets. Friends, partial obedience is always and actually it is disobedience. And there could be some serious consequences of this if partial, obe of partial obedience. And today I'm going to share with you another story from the Bible. And this is a very well known story about Prophet Samuel and King Saul. King Saul was king before King David came in. Alright? So, the story is about King Saul. Come, come, come. The story is about King Saul. And you can find it this in 1 Samuel chapter 15. And this, uh, this is, uh, here we see Prophet Samuel coming and talking to, uh, to King Saul, who was not king at that time. And he came and spoke to Saul and said, The Lord has sent me to anoint you as king. So God had chosen Saul, Saul to be the king of Israel. What a blessing. What a blessing. And then later on, as soon as uh, uh, Prophet Samuel blesses and anoints king Saul as King Saul, he gives them the command which the Lord has given. And this is the command, command which was given to him. 
He said, now go attack the Amalekites and totally destroy everything that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death, uh, to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. So what was the command? The command was to destroy everything all the way down to the smallest of the animal. I mean, this is pretty harsh, right? Coming from God who is a loving father, right? Full of grace, mercy. What do you say? Can you actually digest this coming from God? I mean, the question which comes to our mind is, why? Why even is written there, why did God want Okay, fine. Men and children, men and women. Okay, fine. Elderly people, fine. Infants, children. Come on, God. Where's your mercy? Why do you want to kill infants and children? Why these animals? But God's command was very clear, and there, there's a reason behind this. Why God had given this commandment to to Saul? He's and let, let me explain this to you. You know, when the Israelites had come, had been freed from Egyptian rule and they were wandering in the desert, and that you can see in Exodus, the Amalekites attacked them. The Amalekites attacked them instead of helping them. Right? The Amalekites attacked them instead of helping them. And Moses prayed to the Lord to intervene. And you can see uh, there, was, there was a time when Moses, was, when he was praying, he became tired, his hands were up, he became tired. So the people came to hold his hand and angels came to hold his hand so that he can make continue. You know what was happening? When he was putting his hand down, the Israelites were losing. But when his hand was up, the Israelites were winning. So the angel came and held his hand up so that the blessings may continue to be on board on the Israelites and they would be victorious. And they were actually victorious. They were able to defeat the Amalekites. And that day, the Lord made a promise to Moses. And this you will find in Exodus 17, verse 14. It is written that the Lord made a promise to Moses. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this on a scroll as something to be remembered. And make sure that Joshua hears it. Because I will completely blot out the memory of Amal. Amalek from under the sun. I will blot them out. They will not exist. They will not be there. Simple. So the, if the infant is an Amalekite, if the children is an Amalekite, if the stock, uh, the, 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 the animals there were belong to these people, everything needs to be wiped out. That was God's promise. Why? Because they had slaughtered the Israelites. And he made, I mean, see, God is so precise when he gives his commands. He's telling Moses, write it on something. Why? So that it may be remembered. It may be remembered. And Moses made sure that the guys remembered this. If you see in the next verse, which is there, in Deuteronomy 25, he was a 17 to 19. Remember, and he's telling the Israelites, remember what the Amalekites did to you along the way when you came out of Egypt. When you were weary and worn out, they met you on your journey and cut off all who were lying behind. So basically they came from behind and started killing people who were lying behind, who were tired and, and just behind the, the whole crowd. And as I was reading this, uh, normally when we go off for outings, I'm the one who's left behind, right? All of you guys go ahead and I'm the one <laughs> panting in there, <laughs> trying, trying to catch, catch, catch up with you guys. And I was just recollecting that. And here we see the Amalekites came and killed all those people. And verse 19, when the Lord, your God gives you rest from all enemies around you in the land, He is giving you to possess as an inheritance. You shall blot out the memory of Amalek, Amalek from under, the, under heaven. Do not forget. So these were the instructions given to Israelites. And this promise of God was fulfilled hundreds of years later. 
when the Lord conveys to Saul, King Saul, the command to destroy Amalekites. The command was clear and simple, right? And what it was? It was to go and completely destroy the Amalekites, right? What happened after that? And in the next, in verse 7, it is written there that Saul attacked the Amalekites all the way from Havilah to Shur to the, to the east of Egypt. So Saul did obey the Lord's command and attacked the Amalekites. Wow, great, right? King Saul, who was anointed by God as king over Israel, uh, obeyed the commandment of God. Wonderful thing. Wonderful thing. So yes, he did. But let's look at the next verse. Next two verses in fact. In verse 8 and 9, it is written there, He took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive. And all his people he totally destroyed with the sword. But Saul and the army spared Agag, and the best of the sheep and cattle, the fat cows and lamb, and everything that was good. Right? So what do we see? Who did he spare? The king of Amalekites, right? Agag, the king of Amalekites, he spared. And what else? The best of sheep, the cattle, the fat calves and the lamb. Everything that was good was saved. Was saved. What happened? What was the command from God? Look at verse 3. What was the command? Destroy everything. So here, King Saul partially obeyed God's command. Are you getting it, friends? Partially obeyed God's command. And the Bible also tells us why. Why Saul and his army did that. Saul and, and his army spared Agag and the best of the sheep and cattle, fat cows and everything that was good. In that same verse, later on, it is written there that, oh, not this one, okay, it's not there, that these, they were willing, they were unwilling to destroy completely, but everything that despised and was weak, they totally destroyed. So everything which they did not like, Ah, this is, I don't want this. Finish it off. I don't want these people. Kill them. I don't like them. Finish them off. So they did what they thought was right. They were able to differentiate between good and bad. They made their own decision there. The army, right? So, what they took, what looked good to their eyes. I mean, friend, don't we do that, the same thing many times in our lives. We may, we may feel that, oh, they, they, are, they are wrong. They are wrong what they did. But sometimes we do that. What looks good and seems good to us, we take it. We do it. Even if it is not what God wants us to do or to take. We look at the pleasure of flesh. Many times forget about the soul. If you, if you, speak, if you look into the Bible, you will see Paul had his reasons for doing this. And that reason is a very, very common reason. And it's a reason so common which applies to each one of us. Each one of us. And what was the what, what did he what reason did he give? In terms of not being able to obey fully, he says, I was afraid of the people, so I gave it to them. Peer pressure. Come on friends, doesn't that sound familiar? We do things because of what other people will think of, of me. You know, when I personally, when I started to take alcohol, I knew alcohol is not good for me because my father had died from, of alcohol. So, I needed to move away from alcohol. I hated alcohol. But when I started work, working, when the people, my bosses, they, they were going to bar, they were going to parties, and I was having this glass of orange juice, they didn't say anything to me, but I felt in my heart I'm ridiculous, I'm away, not being part of them. Oh come on, I'm, I should be part of them. 
they, they, when they go out for drinking in the, in the evenings, they might be discussing something strategic. And if I don't be there just because they are drinking alcohol, I will not know about this, I will not be part of it. I will not be concerned about this. I need to take care of my future. So what did I do? Simple. <laughs> I started drinking. I started taking, I started from one thing to the other. One pack I used to take, which used to last me for two hours, and then later on, it was a two hours, I don't know how many packs I used to take. And of course, after that, things were, I used to go out, down and out. So yes, and then it lead, led to a lot of things. See, when men come together and they start drinking, not everything is talk is holy. And then they started participating in the filthy talks, started using filthy language. Because it was part of it, right? It was part of it. I needed to be part of this crowd where I work. These are my bosses, these are my bosses' bosses. They will give me promotion if they are happy, if I am part of them. Peer pressure. And that is what came upon King Saul also. I was afraid of the people, so I gave it to them. We are, we have the fear of being ridiculed, being left out. And in that fear, we go with the crowd, even if it is not good for us, even if it is evil and against the will of God. How will God take it? Will he be happy? Oh, at least my son partially obeyed me. As parents, as I was telling you, right? If you tell a children to clean their rooms and they go into their rooms and put, pick up everything and put it into wherever they find the cupboard or wherever they have, they have they put it there, but the room is clean. Our spirits will, will not be happy and satisfied. We will be upset. What is this? Are you trying to make a fool of me? I know. So you have not, you may have cleaned the room, but this is not what cleaning you are looking for. And God was not happy with Saul also. Let's look at the verse 10. It says, Again Samuel, the Lord spoke to Samuel and asked Samuel to go. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel and he said, I regret that I have made King Saul, Saul the king because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. And when you look at verse 26, it is written there, But Samuel said to him, which is Saul, I will not go back with you, you have rejected the word of God and the Lord has rejected you as king over Israel. Who made him king? God. Who chose him as king? God. But today, God is saying, I regret making this decision of putting him as the king. It greatly displeased God and God, I'm telling you friends, had a change of mind of making King Saul the king. Beloved, I believe when we are not totally obedient to God, it displeases Him. It makes God change His mind about us. Can you hear me? It may make Him change His mind about us, His plans about us if you are not fully obedient to him. Maybe you may just look at your lives. Maybe holding, withholding of blessings from you, a blessing which you have been receiving, suddenly it stops. Maybe not answering your prayers. Or maybe taking something back from you which he has given you. Maybe a material possession, a good health, a peace of mind even a loved one. You must say, how can God change? God has made a plan for me. It's a good plan. He's a good God. Yes, all that is true. But how long? It is not God who wants to change. It is us who induce that change in His plan. When we take life according to our will, our desires, our choices, friends, as we were talking about uh, Sister Lata some time back, today, today, today. Remember what she said when she came here, what example she gave? She said, 
blessing of from God is like the rain. Have you ever seen rain stop midway? It will not stop midway. It will fall. It will flourish the ground. It will reach you. But what will stop it? Is us. From the blessing reaching us. There is an outpour. The front gates of heaven are open for us. For the children of God. But if we are not willing to receive it. We say, no God, I don't want. If I need to make it, uh, if I need to take your blessing, then I have to follow your commandment. I have to. Very close people like that who say, so, so, who say like that. If I accept God, if I do things like God, then I need to obey all the commandments. I don't, can't, I will not be able to do it. I don't want to do it. Partial obedience, is happy. I can write a check and send it to the church. I can give charity. Maybe once in a year, Christmas, Easter, Good Friday, maybe I go to the church. Rest of the year, the time I don't have time. I want to do. Sunday is the only time I need to sleep. I need to rest. Uh, this work, uh, that work. There are so many people like that. Friends, He wants to bless us. But when we, when we do not obey Him fully and completely, He withholds that blessings from us. It is his to give and take. I mean, it's so scary, right? So scary. You know, we do, there are things which are given in the Bible, there are things which are implied, things which are holy, which need to be done. So if you're in any profession, you know what you need to do in that profession, right? If you're doing your project, you can't say, I will not do project the, the way it needs to be done, but I will do it some other way. It may be acceptable, it will not be acceptable. Jay Masam, we are bankers. If we go there in the bank, say, okay, you, you have a process in place, we need to, you, you want me to follow through, but I will ignore all your processes. I want to do it my own way. We will be kicked out. We say, you are not needed there. So there are few things which I have already implied. If you look at Judas, the, the disciple of Jesus, right? But Judas was chosen by who? By Jesus himself. As one of the disciples. And Jesus knew the weakness of Judas. What, what was Jesus, Judas in charge of in the, in, in the discipleship of, of Jesus? What was he in charge of? The money. <laughs> money is the weakness of human being. And here... Jesus and the disciples gave this responsibility to a person who was, who, was, who was already weak. If you look at the Bible, you will find it there that Judas used to use that money for his own purposes. But he, what you will find unique in the Bible is nowhere the disciples of Jesus, knowing this, this weakness, knowing that he has been doing it, rebuked him. He was accepted with his weakness in the community of Jesus. Just like we are, sinners. But the only thing is, he went way beyond. Judas went way beyond and betrayed Jesus. And what was the what, what was his end? His end was that he had to hang himself. He had to hang himself. He didn't receive any peace, any, any forgiveness. So, you know, what happened to Saul? Think Saul, as you were discussing about Saul. What happened to Saul? Saul was rejected by God as king, and King David was blessed as a child. King David was blessed to, to take, her, take his place. And you can see in the Bible there, he. King Saul went so many troubles he faced. So many troubles. And then finally King David, who was a mere shepherd boy, was anointed king over Israel. You know, when I was preparing uh, this message, when I read the very last verse in chapter 15, and I, when I read it, I read it once, okay, fine, I mean, I read it, okay, fine, it didn't impact me. 
Then I read twice. And I said, what is this verse? Why is this verse given there? And then led me, that led me to another verse which I had read earlier also in the same chapter. And the verses are like this. It's written there. Until the day Samuel died, he did not go to see Saul again. So Samuel mourned for him. Samuel mourned for him. And then earlier when I saw the uh, verse 11, it is written there, Samuel was troubled and he cried out to the Lord all the night. I was wondering, Samuel, why did he have to mourn for, for a deed or wrong deed or a, a disobedience done by somebody else? Why was he mourning? Why was he so worried about this, this person? Fine, they had a relationship, a good relationship of that. He said, Prophet Samuel had so many other people. But then why was he losing his sleep for this one man? God had to deal with him. He was, Samuel was doing what was, what was covered by God. So he was complete obedience. You know, and that, I just sat back and started to think why. Why did Samuel mourn for Saul? And that gave me the answer to a question which has been in my heart. Why do pastors, Pastor Andrew Moses, uh, uh, Sister, uh, Sister Beulah, Pastor Ivan Sattarvata, so many other people, why do they hurt? Why do they cry when they pray for other people's needs? When they see the other people in pain, when they see the other people going towards sin, why, why, why does it hurt us? I'm telling you, it hurts. It hurts me, and I really pray for many of many of us here, many of the people who I know of. And why do I don't? I feel Mister. Why do I need to cry? Why do I? Why do tears come out of my eyes? But they do. I can't stop them. Why? And this is the answer. Because we are called to pray. We are called to lead. We are called to intercede. And it really, friends, it pains my heart to see how Satan is leading God's people towards hell, towards eternal damnation. And that's how I actually felt, how Samuel must have felt at that time. Friends, today, today's message basically serves as an introduction to what Brother Raju is going to speak about next Sunday. What does it mean to be fully obedient? Is full obedience possible actually? Can we actually do it? Humanly is it possible? We will speak about that next Sunday. Today I have spoken to you in terms of what you should not do with regards to obedience. Next Sunday he will bring what you should be doing in terms of obedience. Beloved, be very careful about partial obedience. You know, in what matters you yourself know in what matters you are not fully obedient. Know that partial obedience is willful disobedience against the will of God. We don't get to pick and choose this commandment, I will follow this commandment, I will not follow this commandment, I will keep it for later. No. We are called to obey God. We are called to love God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind and all our strength. This is the first commandment given, this is the greatest commandment given by Jesus. All means all. Possible or not, it is possible. It is not possible in our own strength, but possible with this strength. The Lord does not accept hard-hearted obedience. There are no blessings in partial obedience, friends. I, mean, I have no doubt this morning that some of us are here who are partially obeying God in many areas of their life. Friends, examine yourself. There are things that we do in our life that we need to deal with. And you feel you are stuck. You don't know how to go about doing it. Don't think that you can't do it. Because you can. What you can do is, you can run to the cross. You can trust Him more and more. More than yourself, I would say. More than yourself. 
You don't. You may not get all the answers. You may not have the, all the answers. You don't need all the answers. You don't have to figure it out. But the fact of the matter is, you need to submit to God. Your doubts, your concerns, your questions, your challenges, which is beyond you, submit to God. And that is what the, the testimony which I gave you today during the time of sharing. This person, this family, once they said they have submitted to God, God started to move in their life. I'm telling you friends, every day I receive a call telling me this has happened. You know, Pastor, today this happened. Today this happened. And it's all new. And it's just coming as a surprise for those people. But I know it's not a surprise. God is moving. And then soon enough there will be reconciliation. There will be celebration. And all of you will know that very soon. You will see it very soon. So, obedience and submission to God is so important. Friends, today as we come to the table of the Lord, as we come to the table of the Lord, we ask you to prepare yourself. Today, being first Sunday of the month, we are going to take communion. But before we take communion, Ash, can you just play something? Before we take communion, may I ask you to just close your eyes, Lord, and your heads. And examine yourself. Examine your heart. Forget you put your mind. Examine your heart. Examine your relationship with God. What is it that you need to do to draw closer to God? Are you feeling that the Lord is withholding His blessings from you? He's not opening the doors for you. He's not giving that healing which you are needing. You, you're not seeing prosperity in your business. You're not seeing success in your projects. Ch challenges are coming your way. Things are not moving. Submit to God. Submit to God. God knows your weaknesses. He, nothing is hidden from you. He's your creator. He's our creator. Nothing is hidden from you. So it's good to that you speak out to Him. And tell Him, God, these are the areas where I need you. I need you, Jesus. I need your support. I need your guidance. As these emblems come your way, if you know what we are doing, please partake in this. If you don't know what we are doing, you may let go. You may partake it next time. But hold on to them as you as you receive them. Friends, when we come to the Lord, we don't need to perfect ourselves. We don't need to wear makeup. We don't need to wear nice clothes. We don't need to put on put on put on a, on, on a face, a smiling face. No, we don't need to. We come into a Father who knows our inside out. Nothing is hidden from him. I mean, you can go to your earthly father, earthly mother. With, with, with a different face and that, that your earthly mother or father, your parents may not be able to know what's going on in your heart. You may be able to deceive them, but our Heavenly Father knows everything. 
Nothing is hidden from Him. He knows. So there is just no point in hiding your pain from Him. And you know what He says? Come to me. Open your mouth and tell me. And I will answer you. I will bless you. I will touch you. Nothing is impossible for me. That's what He says. Things may be impossible for us, things may be challenging for us, but nothing is impossible for us. So today as you hold these emblems in your hand, friends, ask the Lord, Lord, these emblems are holding in faith. We just close your eyes and just say, Lord, I'm holding these emblems in my hand in faith. That Lord, this bread which I'm holding represents your body, which you have allowed to be broken for us. For us who were sinners, you did not ask us to repent and then you will do it. But you went ahead and did it for us. And this cup that we hold represents your blood, which you allowed to be flowed out from your body for forgiveness of our sins, that we may be cleansed, we may be white as snow. We thank you, Lord. Today, as we hold these emblems in our hand, Lord. Lord, we ask you, Lord, just to bless us, Lord. Bless us, Lord. And Lord, we rebuke anything which is stopping your blessings from reaching us, Lord. And we say, Lord, we submit to you. Let your will be done in my life. Not my life. Not my will in my life, Lord. But let your will be done in my life, Lord. And Lord, whatever decisions that we may take in in our life, Lord, will be blessed by you, Lord. We'll always bring it to you, Lord. And only when you, Lord, say yes, then we'll go ahead, Lord. So, Lord, we ask you, Lord Jesus, take your will be done in my life, in our life, Lord. The life of this church, Lord. We thank you, Jesus, for taking on our shame, our sin upon yourself, Lord. Today, Lord, as we partake together in this eating of this, of this bread, Lord, and drink now from the cup, Lord. You bless these, Lord. And now let it be, Lord, that our brokenness would be made complete, Lord, by eating of this bread, Lord. Let's eat of the bread together and ask the Lord that He will make your body complete. Whatever pain or agony or some or healing that you need, He will make it complete and your body will be made whole as good as new. Lord, as we drink this cup, Lord, we ask you, Lord Jesus, let it run in our veins, Lord, just like blood, Lord, and Lord, flush out everything, Lord, which is not from you, Lord Jesus, because we do not want anything, Lord, which is not from in us, Lord. Let's eat, let's drink all the cup together. Thank you, Jesus, for being with us, Lord. Thank you for your word, Lord. Help us, Lord, just to meditate upon it, Lord, as we go back our ways, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. Help us to be fully obedient to you, Lord. Lord, we know that partial obedience you do not accept, Lord. Help us to be fully obedient to you, Lord. In your name, Lord, we say, Amen. 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 Let's say the Lord's prayer together. One, two, three. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. That will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us out of the temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for this time. Thank you for your presence here, Lord. Thank you for this service, Lord Jesus. Thank you for the people who are here, Lord. Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I bless them and their families, Lord Jesus. Keep them safe and protected, Lord Jesus. And Lord, let them, uh, they go back to their homes, Lord. Let those blessings, Lord, even they have received today, Lord, let them be offered from them, Lord, into their family members and their loved ones, Lord Jesus. You be with them, Lord Jesus. And bring them back here next week, Lord, to receive from them and come together as your body, Lord. In your name, Lord, we say. Amen. Amen. Let's give a clap up to our Father.